Well, we're in the second session of our exploration of the book of Genesis. And uh, uh, I should uh, uh, emphasize that we, we are going to include, especially in these first few sessions, some technical material that's strictly extra. Uh, we will, uh, rather than exclude it because it's maybe of narrow interest, we're including some technology issues for those that do have the background because one of the problems we have as Christians is that we've all been brainwashed with pseudoscience, falsehoods that masquerade as truth. And uh, the more technical background you have, the more you get barraged with that on the one hand, and yet to the extent that you have competent, current technical background, it's an asset not to be hoodwinked by the foolishness that masquerades as science. And so uh, there are many views, many competent views, of these early chapters. We're going to present but one of them. But at the same time, I think we want one of our intentions is not only to try to put it in the context of current scientific discoveries, but also put it in the context of stretching our imaginations a bit. Because many of the problems that people feel or imagine are really from misunderstandings, either misunderstanding the text or misunderstanding science. Because where they're both, where they're both accurate, they agree. There's no reason for science and the biblical text to be at variance. It'll appear at variance because of our incomplete understanding of the text on the one hand and some uh, uh, unfortunate conjectures masquerading as science on the other. And so there will be times we'll get in some technical material. I'll do it lightly. Uh, but in any case, let's just get into it. We're in Genesis. Uh, we're on day one. Now, last time, we just had an introduction. It wasn't, we actually only covered one verse. And I, facetious, I facetiously said we did 28 letters. And if you know there's you know, 300,000 letters in the Torah, it's going to take a while to get through it. And of course, I was being facetious because we are, things will pick up as we go. But last time we talked about the Torah in general, and that is the books of Moses and the book of Genesis in particular, with particular emphasis on its authorship. There's all kinds of nonsense in all kinds of pseudo-Christian literature that tries to attribute the uh, books of Moses to different authors. Uh, the so-called documentary hypothesis, which is utter rubbish. And uh, uh, we've saved you hours of boring library research by simply pointing out that Jesus Christ authenticated it. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you've got no problem with the book of Genesis and who wrote it. And if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you've got much bigger problems than who wrote the book of Genesis. But, so we talked about that in detail and how frequently it's quoted all through the Old and New Testament. One of the things you do need to understand, that if for some reason you're uncomfortable about the 24, six 24-hour days, uh, that's not really optional. Because you'll discover, unfortunately, in a sense, that Jesus taught us they were 24-hour days. And all the writers of the New Testament lean on heavily the first 10 chapters of Genesis which includes not just the creation, but also the flood of Noah. So these are fundamental issues. And to try to weave a, 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 a way around the idea of six-day creation actually creates huge problems in your theology that may not be as obvious at first. So you want to deal with this. And uh, don't just accept it. Do some study. But you want to come to terms with that because it does uh, uh, contribute as a fundamental part to your biblical position. It's, far, it's not simply a peripheral issue. I used to think it was. I figured, well, it's, you know, different people have different views. But the more you discover the integrity of the Bible as a whole, the more you begin to realize that each of these issues all interlock with each other. So you need to deal with it. And of course, Genesis is the book of beginnings. All, everything in the Bible, it starts, starts in Genesis and finishes in Revelation. Uh, it also anticipates all false beliefs. We went through a list of those last time. But one of the things that, of course, is probably most troubling to the average person and also to the technically trained person is the age of the earth. There are good Christians that um, hold the view that the earth is billions of years old. There are also many top scientists that believe the earth was created in six days. In fact, 50 of them wrote a book together called in six days, their testimonies. And uh, so that's an issue that uh, is complicated because there's lots of misinformation floating around on the one hand. There are a lot of technologies involved that are incomplete. 
We're still learning about radiocarbon dating and, and te techniques like that, which have all kinds of assumptions that are very fragile, very, um, very mixed reviews. So there's a lot of research going on in those areas. The good news is there are outstanding institutes doing that research. The Institute of Creation Research in San Diego, Creation Science Center, uh, Walt Brown, and Answers in Genesis. There's a number of world-renowned groups of hundreds of PhD scientists that are attacking these issues uh, in, a, in an open way. And so that's, if you, those of you that have an interest and a background to get into it, there's plenty of resources around. In fact, part of the problem in dealing with this, these presentations is to try to sift and just to get some of the highlights without getting too, too uh, technical. But, uh, and of course, last time we also talked a little bit about this peculiar discovery about pi and E, which is obviously very peripheral uh, to our interests. Well, we're now in what I'll call Sunday, day one. Had to be a Sunday if the seventh day is a, is a Shabbat, right? So I'll call this Sunday day one, and it's the verses two through five of chapter one. And the primary thing that we're going to encounter here is the Holy Spirit is beginning to move. And, uh, but we're going to discover this, uh, there are some other topics that we'll encounter as we get into this chapter. The so-called gap theory, what is it and what does it mean, which will lead us to a little bit of an exploration of the origin of Satan. What's that all about? And then the technical uh, addenda to the discussion will be a discussion of the mysterious nature of light itself. Because we'll encounter the first quote of God is, let there be light. And we also, to this day, light represents one of the most paradoxical mysteries in the field of science. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go. And then uh, the next session will be the second day where we'll talk about big bang models and we'll talk about the nature of space itself, hyperdimensions and some quantum physics, just a touch of that. On the third day, the Tuesday, uh, we'll talk about life, vegetation and so forth, the origin of life, what does that really mean? That'll introduce us a little more into thermodynamics and entropy and those things and some fascinating insights from molecular chemistry. Then the fourth day, we'll talk about stars and planets. We'll explore the so-called nebular hypothesis, which uh, many people still get taught in astronomy classes, which is uh, astonishing, really, when you, when you understand it. But um, the anthropic principle. We'll talk about the search for extraterrestrial life and the incredible benefits you and I get from those studies. And the signs in the heavens and uh, some discoveries in the text of the Genesis having to do with the appointed times, the seasons, some surprises, I think. The fifth day will be fish and fowl. We'll talk about the fallacy of evolution. We'll focus on the evidences of design and a surprising um, perspective from this issue of biodiversity that uh, we'll talk about. Sixth day, of course, will be animals and man. And of course, we'll explore the DNA and the role of information in all this. And we'll get into the architecture of man himself. Some surprising materials there, I, I suspect. And that leads us, of course, to the seventh day with its surprises. So that's what we're about. So here we are, the first five verses of the book of Genesis. And I put it on the screen, but I encourage you to watch, you know, to look at it through your own Bibles if it's convenient. The lighting's good there. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If we took those, that verse last time. If you understand and believe that verse, everything else will fall into place. If you have problems with that verse, you've got problems. And uh, you need to uh, hit that head on. And uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Period. Done. Verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the, the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were day one. Your Bible may say the first day, but it, technically it's day one. It's unique that way. The others are all different. So uh, we'll take this, we'll get into it little by little. Verse 2 is a verse that has generated library shelves of conjectures and speculations that um, we don't want to spend too much time on, but are worthy of at least a good look. And the, and the, the verse says, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The first problem is this conjunction was, or excuse me, excuse me the verb was. And uh, it turns out, that's Hayek. It's uh, it actually because of the word order that we have here, 
which is normally a conjunction, a verb, a subject, and an object, the word order is changed to imply what's called the pluperfect form of that verb to be. And it can, there are good, competent Hebrew experts that argue that this really should read, not only became, had become. So it's, um, uh, and the same word is used in Genesis 19, verse 26, speaking of Lot's wife. When she turned and looked back, she became a pillar of salt. Same word. Um, it's a transitive verb. It implies an action an ob on, the ac uh, 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 on an object. So that's part, that's part of the problem. The next part of the problem is that the earth was without form and void. The word without form is tohu. It's tohu vabohu. Tohu is a Hebrew word meaning without form or confused. And it's coupled here with void or bohu. It's tohu vabohu. This is the phrase that scholars have wrestled with for centuries. Um, it, it, it's void, means empty or waste. And uh, there's another uh, aspect of this. The conjunction that opens this sentence is a vav conjunction. But it can translate it and, but it can also be translated as an adversative. And it, uh, that is but. And there are experts that argue for a number of reasons it should be at an adversative conjunction. To give you perhaps the stellar example of that view is the Septuagint version. You may, most of you realize that uh, three centuries before Christ's ministry, the whole Jewish world spoke Greek, not Hebrew. Hebrew was used uh, ceremonially, much as, as Catholics use Latin. If you were a Jew raised in Alexander's uh, empire or following, even in the early Roman Empire, um, you probably spoke Greek and didn't know Hebrew necessarily. So you had a desire to have your scriptures in your natural language. And to, to serve that need, under Ptolemy of Philadelphus in Alexandria, which is one of the major intellectual capitals in the ancient world, he, they, they impaneled 70 scholars, the best Hebrew scholars they could find, to translate the Old Testament into Greek. And the work product, we have four copies of it, is called the Septuagint translation. Septuagint is a fancy word for 70. And that's a very handy thing to have because the Hebrew language has its advantages and disadvantages, but the Greek language is incredibly precise in its structure, in its vocabulary, and the rest. So having these experts translate the Old Testament into Greek is a useful tool when you're examining a passage in the, in the Old Testament for its nuances. And so in, it's interesting that in the Septuagint, this sentence, the word and, is actually translated but. And that, when you put this all together, you get quite a different construction. And uh, the way it, uh, it uh, um, reads here is not the way it would read if you translate it, taking advantage of what I just told you. Sentence one is not unchanged. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse two, but the earth had become or became without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, the idea here is the language hints at the possibility that there may be a gap between verse 1 and 2. That's why people call this the gap theory. You'll find when you look at some of these words in um, uh, Isaiah 34 verse 11 and Isaiah 45 18 and Jeremiah 4 23 that these very words take on a very strange application. Let's just take a look at some of these passages. In Isaiah 34, 11, uh, but the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it, the owl also and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. I just put this in here for vocabulary. Here again is tohu means confusion, without form, and emptiness is another word for, for bohu. Uh, without form and void, or confusion and emptiness is the idea. Confusion implies that it was once ordered, but it's now confused. You follow me? And so let's take a look at Isaiah 5, 45, 18. Isaiah 45, I hesitated. I almost was going to put the whole chapter into the slide so we could go through it, but I didn't. we will be referring to this chapter again and again over the coming sessions. And I encourage you in your devotional study to read chapter 45 for two reasons. It's a prophetic chapter in some surprising ways. Uh, Cyrus, the Persian, has just conquered Babylon. And as he makes his victorious entry into the city of Babylon, 
he is greeted by Daniel, of all people, who shows him a, a letter written to him by name 150 years earlier. It's in Isaiah 45, the last few verses of 44 and then 45, where God says to Cyrus, because I am calling you by name, you'll know that I'm the God of Israel. And he highlights his career. And Cyrus is stunned. It's a matter of history. He, in fact, because of that incident, not only frees the Hebrew slaves that he's just conquered, he uh, gives them financial incentives to go home and build their temple. And so uh, it's a very famous passage. But in that passage, as God is writing this letter to Cyrus, it's one of those rare places where God really um, argues for himself. You know, the Bible generally doesn't argue for God. It generally just assumes it. This is one of those passages where God really challenges the reader, not just Cyrus, but whoever's reading it, who, as to who God really is. And he makes some interesting remarks. That's why you want to read the chapter yourself. But one of those verses, in verse 18 of chapter 45, God says a very strange thing. Let's read it. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. There's that very word in this passage for vain, the same word tohu, without form, confused. He didn't create it confused. Yet we find it confused in verse 2 is the argument. But let's go on. Jeremiah has a vision. There's an interesting passage in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23 and following. He says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. There's that same phrase again, same words, tohu vabohu, without form, confused, void, empty, waste. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. And it continues, I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. And I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. So this seems to describe a judgment. There were cities, but they're empty. Uh, it was fruitful at one time, but now it's not. It's a wilderness. Jeremiah is seeing this desolation. Uses the same phrase. So as a minimum here, we get the impression that this tohu vubohu, in fact, we discover by examining the scripture, tohu vubohu is a phrase that almost is always associated not just with confusion and void, but as a result of a judgment. And so this sounds like a judgment. Now, maybe it was a historical. Scholars, some would argue, well, this was maybe some historical judgment, except the language is pretty sweeping. So some suspect that maybe Jeremiah is getting a glimpse of a judgment that preceded Genesis verse 2. And the earth became without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The word darkness there isn't the normal word for darkness. It's chosek, which means an unnatural darkness. This was the darkness that we saw in Exodus 10 that was so thick they could cut it. It wasn't just absence of light. It was something else. It was dark, a different kind of darkness. That's what's, And darkness was upon the face of the deep. What is the deep? The word for deep is tohon in the Hebrew. You'll recognize it in the Greek. It's the abuso. It's the abyss. It's the place from which the Antichrist emerges and other things. Strange place. And the Greek is abuso or abusus, from which we get the word abyss. It is described in the scripture many different ways to be the home of the demons and evil spirits. So darkness was upon the face of the deep. So this is a spooky, this is a spooky verse. Now, um, what we've looked at here, there's some basic issues we need to ask ourselves. When were the angels created? Well, obviously they're created in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The, ver the, the phrase is intentionally all-encompassing. No problem there. But there's something very interesting we'll discover. We want to know when the angels uh, were created and when did Satan fall? We know that Satan fell, right? And the whole issue is, is it possible this happened in the gap between verse 1 and 2? The gap theory is something that was originally suggested by Thomas Chalmers in 1814. And it's been supported by guys like G.H. Pember, Donald Gray Barnhouse, G. Campbell Morgan, Arthur Custance, and others. That doesn't mean they're right, but I want you to understand this isn't a fringe thing. There are some really well-known, highly competent, 
uh, conservative uh, scholars that embrace this view. I don't think any of them sell it hard. They all just allow that it's very likely a possibility. You follow me? And I don't want to oversell it either in my enthusiasm to get across to you. I want you to be aware of the view. I want you to be recognize the possibilities that it might include, OK? Because it still is a conjecture, and we need to discern the differences. It's highly speculative and controversial. But it does seem to link a lot of different passages. And it's, it is very provocative, but there's something else I want to point out right up front. Even if you accept the gap theory, you think, gee, this really makes sense, it does nothing for you as far as dinosaurs or the age of the Earth is concerned. A lot of people take the gap theory and they try to use it as their way to get the millions and millions of years for dinosaurs. That's nonsense. The dinosaurs were in the time of Adam. They died. That means they were after Adam's death. There's a whole, you'll discover that even if you accept the gap theory, it isn't appropriate to solve some of the problems that you and I will encounter downstream. But there is an interesting implication. We know from Job, and I'll show you the passage in a minute, that the angels witnessed the creation of the earth. See, when we look at uh, Job 38, is one of these other chapters that you want to jot down for your devotional time sometime. Uh, the, it's at the end of the book of Job. They've had all these dialogues and things. Job's conducting himself pretty well. But it gets to the point where God steps in and he gives Job a science quiz. Chapter 38 is filled with questions that God is asking Job. Where were you when this and that and the other thing? And so it's a fabulous, fabulous chapter. We could spend a whole semester just going through that chapter and, and drawing on the technical science things that are in that chapter. But let's just look at verses 4 through 7. God speaking to Job. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. See him challenge. He's challenging Job's arrogance here. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Where are the foundations thereof fastened? And who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The sons of God in the Hebrew is Bar HaElohim. It's a term always used in the Old Testament of angels. Four or five times. That specific term always refers to angels. So what this tells us something interesting here is that apparently the angels were there applauding at the, watching the creation. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. All the sons of God shouted for joy. Sons of God are angels. All the angels at, you know, apparently when the earth was, were cheering. Interesting. Well, this brings us to talk about a problem angel. Because we're going to encounter this guy in chapter 3. When we get to chapter 3, he will already have fallen. So it raises the question, when did he fall? He's already fallen in chapter 3. He was created in chapter 1, verse 1. Somewhere in there, it doesn't tell us when he fell. But let's find out what we can by a quick glimpse of his origin, his agenda, and his destiny. There are two passages that are pivotal here. One is in Ezekiel 28, and one is in Isaiah 14. It's easy to remember, they're both multiples of seven. Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. Let's take the Ezekiel one first. For two reasons. You'll learn something about Satan, but you'll also discover a technique that the Bible uses to communicate. Very often in the scripture, God will direct his prophet or whoever to address a certain person, but the language will go beyond the individual involved to the power behind him. The first is almost just the occasion that gives forth a whole other disclosure. That happens frequently, and this is one of the places. You want to get used to that, because until you recognize that that's a rhetorical technique, it may throw you. Here, uh, Ezekiel, God says to Ezekiel, Son of man, that's just a term he uses of Ezekiel all through here. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre, of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in the garden of God. Every precious stone, wait, 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 whoa, wait a minute here. What's this thing? I should explain, by the way, 
The verses prior to this, Ezekiel is told to take up a discussion against the prince of Tyre. There's a verse or two about him. Then it gets to this verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre. Different phrase. And we infer from what's coming, from having read ahead, we're going to be looking at the power behind the prince of Tyre. You follow me? Sometimes the prince, uh, the prince is a term used of a super angel. Sometimes it's used of a potentate, as, as, as we would think of it. But here we have any son of man, take up lamentation against, uh, upon the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom, perfect beauty. In other words, this guy, apparently, is the epitome of wisdom. Thou sealest up the sum. You're it. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. This guy is perfect. That is completely beautiful. That's interesting. You need to get rid of this idea that Satan's ugly. If Satan was ugly, no one would follow him. He's the most attractive creature, in a sense, that God created. Because let's be on. Here's the next phrase. This is, real, this is the real tip-off. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. There's no way the literal king of Tyre would even know where Eden was, let alone be there, right? So this suddenly we begin to realize the focus of this message that, that, Ezekiel has been, that God told Ezekiel to deliver isn't the literal king, it's the power behind him. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, and I want you to notice the description of Eden. It's very different than your Sunday school coloring books. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle and gold. This is a classic way of describing colored light. To, to speak in terms of jewels, semi-precious jewels. We find it here. We find it on the brush of the high priest. We find it in the New Jerusalem and so forth. It, it occurs frequently. We do understand that... God is a God of light. We know the, that, that uh, the, the angels and also um, Adam and Eve before they fell were clothed with light. This may be nothing more than a, a, a rhetorical problem that they're solving that way. It may be more than that. But notice it goes on. The workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. So this is a guy is, that's created. He's not an offspring of the king of Trier. He's not a son. He is a created being. Okay. It's interesting that part of the workmanship in his being created is his musical ability. We've got tambourines and lutes, and there's some dispute exactly what those have in mind. It turns out, I did quite a study of this, and I discovered we, we have lots of words in the Hebrew that are musical, but no one's quite sure what any of them mean. There's a lot of debate about exactly what instruments and what you can go through a whole thing uh, chasing that down, and it's not crisp, not, not tightly defined. But in any case, Clearly, though, he had, a, among other things, a musical ability. And there is a rumor that you know, people, there's a commonly held view that he led worship in heaven. You'll see why in a little bit. And uh, that may be true. It's certainly true that he's still trying. <laughs> lead worship, that is. But uh, <laughs> you picked up on that, okay. But thou hast been e in Eden, the garden of God. So that narrows it down, because there's only three people we know that were in Eden, right? Adam and Eve and this Nachash, the shining one. We'll talk about that when we get to chapter 3 of Genesis. But uh, and he is a created being. But then the next verse says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. That's old English for saying that he was a cherub. That's the super angels. These are the, the, these are the, the top rung of the organizational ladder. These guys are the, the muscle guys. These are guys that are always associated with the protection of the deity of God. They surround his throne. They're emblazoned on the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, we're going to discover there's a cherub that was authorized to guard the way the, the, to the tree of life. And most people don't understand what that means. I'll deal with that when we get to chapter 3. Why did it have to be a cherub? Why not a regular angel? There's some reasons for that. Thou art anointed, the anointed cherub that covereth. That means, that's old English, we're saying he's in charge. He's covering, he's, he's in charge of the whole operation. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. He's got the authority, the anointing, to be in charge, okay? And I have set thee so, God says. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast, there's again, the stones of fire, a strange phrase for us, but these precious stones, I suspect, are speaking of light, not, not, not con contained gems, if you will. You follow me? 
Anyway, bear in mind, see, we're de here we're dealing with hyperspaces. We'll talk about that next time. But there's no reason to presume that this is all in three dimensions. It might be in more, is my point. But let's go on. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. There's his report card. It starts off great. Thou wast perfect, complete, in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. He is a created being. And by the way, I have some news for you. You might want to write this down. He was not Christ's brother. Okay? I just thought I'd get that out of the way. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. And here is this painful milestone word. Till. Iniquity is found in thee. You could probably undertake an interesting study to write down all the untils in the scripture and track them down. Some of them are quite trivial. Some of them are major milestones of, of incredible theological importance. And this is one of them. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. And that's where we all should just gasp in horror. Here's the perfect environment. We're in heaven. Here's the number one guy, Mr. Uno. He's the guy running the place for God himself. He's in charge. He's beautiful. He's perfect. He's got everything going for him. And he blows it. Sin enters in the situation in his heart. Let's take a look at it. The anointed cherub that covereth is the guy we're talking about. Till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy traffic or merchandise, it's the same word in the Hebrew, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Wow. It goes on, but let's just catch our breath here. O covering cherub, thy heart was lifted up. See, that's where sin always begins, in the heart. And it was through pride. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, and thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of the brightness. Pride. Satan fell through pride. When you understand the consequences of that, you can begin to understand why God hates pride in all of us. It's echoes of the first of this problem. It also is illuminating to understand then that God uses leaven as a symbol of pride, of, uh, of sin. Because leaven corrupts by puffing up. And you say, that's a pun. Yes, it is. Puns are very common rhetorical devices. I will, because I will cast thee to the ground, I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries, thy sanctuaries, gee, that's interesting, by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore I, will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. They, thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. That's obviously later. In other words, he's going to be a terror for quite a while. But ultimate, ultimately, he's going to be taken care of. It's outlined here. Well, let's shift to another passage of a similar kind in Isaiah 14. In this case, Isaiah is asked to address the king of Babylon. But quickly, you discover, if you read the passage from verse 12 on, the language goes beyond the king of Babylon and speaks of the power that he represents, the power that's behind him. And verse 12 starts out, How thou art fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. This is the only place the word occurs. It's occurred here as a title. The shining one, the bright one, the morning stars. All These are all equivalent kinds of constructions. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. 
These are the famous five I wills. These are the expressions of ambition. The pride led to ambition and the ambition led to a fall. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He's got a throne. That's interesting. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. doesn't say he's going to supplant the most high. He's going to be equal. It's technicality. It's still, it's still blasphemous. One of the things that I begin to suspect is that one of the reasons, he, he hates Adam for lots of reasons. One of which he probably saw Adam as a rival. Because it's Adam's ultimate destin, destiny will be through the, birth, through the birth, ministry, and death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to be heir to that which Satan forfeited, plus a lot more, actually. But God continues, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, or Sheol, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world, oh, oh as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? What on earth is verse 17 talking about? Nobody knows. Some of that could be prophetic in the future when the world will be a wilderness because of the judgments that are coming, whatever. Some scholars suspect that maybe there's a hint that there was a world of some kind that was destroyed as part of the judgment against Satan. There's even conjectures that the, the original earth may have been his throne or his primary seed of, of um, operation. And through, through his fall and so forth, it was destroyed. And it may have laid, this is the way Barnhouse opens his book called The Invisible War, it may have laid in ruin for billions of years because Satan was incapable of creating anything. And it lay in ruin as a result of this fall until the Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, brooded over the waters. And we have the creation that we see in Genesis verse 2 following. So that leads to a view, not necessarily a correct one, a conjecture, that maybe what we're looking at with, from, the, from verse 2 on is a creation and an era and a whole universe that was subsequent to, some, subsequent to something that happened earlier, something in the celestial realm, something... Because Satan's already a bad actor. He comes on the scene as Adam begins to get a start. huh? So it's a possibility. Are we certain of it? No. But it's a provocative conjecture. So when we read this in Genesis chapter 1, the first two verses, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. This is the first direct quote of God in the Bible. It also turns out that light itself, even in the, in the very frontiers of the most advanced science today, it still poses astonishing discoveries and, and, and mysteries. Now, the Spirit of God moved. The word is matter of fact, which means to hover above or flutter, brood or vibrate. The Spirit of God is, is it, the, the image the language seems to suggest it's almost like a hen sitting on her chicks, brooding over it. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, and it's a one-time occurrence. And, uh, and by the way, this, it's the same word that's used elsewhere. Second Peter, uh, chapter one, verse twenty-one, that men spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Same, same word, same word. It wasn't the Greek, it wasn't Hebrew, but the same, same thought is underlying all that. And uh, so, okay. First direct quote of God, let there be light, and there was light. I want to uh, insert here a little side study, because I think it's relevant to our understanding, to talk a little bit about the nature of light. This first direct quote of God, all of us have different views of what that really may mean. Light has a paradoxical nature. Is, does light consist of waves, or does light consist of particles? How many think that light is like waves? Is he any show of hands? Anyone here feel that way? Okay, about 30%, 20%, 20%. How many feel that light is a stream of particles? 
Okay, that's, that's about two-thirds. You're both right, depending on who's looking. <laughs> you see what I mean? We'll talk about the velocity of light, and that's, that, this is kind of fun because when I gave my uh, the study of Genesis a decade or two ago at Calvary Chapel, I mentioned it then at, that life, light was not a constant. And some of my dearest friends, who are very, very expert in Einstein's theory of relativity, uh, one of the guys that came to the Lord in my first revelation study at my home many years earlier, a dear friend. And also he's chairman of a ministry that is a prominent apologetic ministry in which the leader is a very, very bright guy. They're both physics sophisticated people. And they, tore me, they took me apart privately. Chuck, you can't, you got to understand light's a constant. You know, I, I, mean, I really took a lot of abuse for this because I banked on Barry Satterfield and some papers that had ju that just come out about that time. And it, it amuses me because... I'm going to give you the same material I gave then, but I can give it to you confidently now because suddenly in the last couple of years, the physics dis community has finally discovered, guess what? The speed of light's not a constant. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And I'm going to give you an analogy of holograms that I think you might find interesting, but let's talk about the central paradox of light. Sir Isaac Newton, of course, is probably without peer in the history of science, 17th century. Uh, he viewed light as a stream of particles. And he had reasons for doing so. And because he did, everybody did. It was a follow the leader kind of thing, right? It, a guy that was about 13 years older than him, uh, Huggins, uh, developed a wave theory of light because he, he, from the fact that light can be refracted and reflected implies it acts like waves. But he was um, not really listened to because I, everybody listened. Sir Isaac Newton had the insight on, on truth. There are a couple other guys, Leonard Euler and uh, Ben Franklin, were also ignored until two developments occurred in the early 19th century. Euler was the father of geometry, trig, calculus. He discovered the, uh, the imaginary as uh, square root of minus one integration. He's a very, very, very prominent mathematician. And of course, Ben Franklin was quite a, uh, a broad uh, Renaissance kind of guy too. But we had wave discoveries. Thomas, a guy by the name of Thomas Young conducted an interesting experiment called the two-slit experiment. I'm going to show you what that is because it totally shattered the scientific world at the time and still does to anyone that hasn't really studied this, the two-slit experiment, which demonstrates the wave, that it's really a wave-like thing. A guy by the name of Fresnel, uh, uh, he, he, his experiments are more complete, and he concluded also that, the, uh, that light was re uh, behaved like waves. The Fresnel lens is, uh, was designed for lighthouses. It, it, he designed lenses that were uh, uh, that light would come out parallel, if you will, in effect. And uh, this is all about the time of the Napoleonic Wars and so forth. So, um, uh, Young, by the way, is an interesting guy for lots of reasons. He has he's, he made contribu contributions to science and capillary actions. Uh, he uh, elasticity. He's the, also the one that was monumental in deciphering the Rosetta Stone and hieroglyphics. The people of that period were incredibly broad gauge. That's why they used the term Renaissance men, I guess. Now, see, Newton was knighted in 1705, and he died in 19, 1727, excuse me, 1705, and died in 1727. So it was still too early to dethrone him. I mean, he had his views, and people would be very reluctant to examine evidence in view of those views. We've got to be careful ourselves, because most of what we've been taught in school is wrong. And, and, and how many of you would take a physics class with 1950 textbooks? <laughs> I wouldn't. You know, I mean, I did. But, I mean, you stop and think what's happened in 50 years. Almost everything that was in those textbooks has been disproven. If you take current textbooks, they're still full of known lies and deceit. And that's one of the great tragedies in our education system. But let me talk a little bit about this two-slit experiment to give you an example. On the left, we have, say, a partition with a slit in it, a little light. A light can come through that slit. And that light can then hit an image, a piece of a, a, a wall or a piece of film or what have you. And if you plot the intensity of that light, obviously in the middle is the brightest and it tapers off. It follows a, uh, something approximating a Gaussian dis distribution. That's all pretty straightforward, no problem. Well, if you, have, if you put between that slit and your, your plane a plane with two slits in it, well, you'd expect the light that hits it the, the, let's just cover up the bottom one and look at the top one only. It will act like a point uh, source of light, and it will. You'll expect, of course, it the distribution of energy to be just like the previous one, right? 
If you cover that one up and do it the other side, you'd get another one. You would expect that if you open both slits, you would get the sum of those two slits, right? That would seem reasonable. If you open both slits, though, you don't get the sum of those. You get something very different. You get the interference between the two. Uh, mathematically, you don't get just h squared plus h squared, uh, h squared plus j squared if you use h and j for the two slits. Um, you get h plus j squared, which spreads out to give you a squared plus j squared plus a whole other term. The, and that's the most powerful term in the, in the, it's the middle one. It's the, it's the interference. So what this slit means is, see, this makes no sense the more you think about it. If light is a stream of particles and you, it, it's going through one of these slits, it appears to know whether the other slit's open or not. Because it, it'll behave differently, follow me? See, it, 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 it's obvious that the individual particles are not operating individually. They're operating organically as a group. And that creates a real mystery because on the one hand, light can be demonstrated to be a stream of particles. It also behaves like waves, both. And that created all kinds of problems. The 19th century, of course, reversed. A guy by the name of Foucault, the guy that did famous for the pendulum, he established, he made a discovery that shook the world at the time, that the speed of light was less in water than in air. Well, that's no surprise for wave theory people, but it makes no sense for the particle people, the corp corpuscular theory. Because if it slows down, what speeds it up again? Are they pushing from the back? I mean, you, know, you, you try to deal with that mathematically, you have real problems. So that, that created all kinds of stir. Then this incredible human being, James Clark Maxwell, comes along. And he's discovered many, many things, but he's primarily responsible for our whole awareness of what we call today the electromagnetic spectrum. And he discovered, among other things, that the light is an electromagnetic wave. So it not only acts like a wave, it acts like a wave in some very profound ways. And a, 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 a contemporary of that time, Heinrich Hertz, established electromagnetic transmission and reception um, uh, as a result of all that. So, so now we get to the 20th century, there's a whole reversal. And then there's this weird experience in 1900. A guy by the name of Max Planck was wrestling with what they call the black body problem. I won't get into all that. But he was trying to get a mathematical uh, description of what was being observed. And out of desperation, having tried everything else, he misapplied a couple of Boltzmann's equations and he applied them incorrectly. And they worked. They really shouldn't have. But he, in doing so, he discovered what that, the implications of the, the experience, and I won't get into all the math here, is that it wouldn't integrate because light comes in little bundles. So it's not, it's, it's not continuous. It's, in, it's, it's, a, it's a, in quanta. And so this revealed, the mathematics revealed a non-continuity that was operative here. It was a few years later that Einstein published the explanation of what Planck had encountered. And it leads to revival, again, not only the corpuscular theory of light, it opens the door to the field that we call today quantum physics. The fact that the subatomic particles behave in the strangest ways. And uh, it's so strange that Boltzmann, who understood the real implications of what they discovered, couldn't handle it. He committed suicide. It so shattered their understanding of reality. And, and uh, we'll talk about the quantum physics next time in more detail because there'll be some reasons for it. But the main idea is that energy is not contiguous, uh, uh, continuous. It comes in little tiny bundles. That was the discovery. What they've discovered since is that length, mass, energy, time itself is quantized. It's in, 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 in digits. The analogy is like a piano. You can hit a key, you can hit the key next to it, but you can't get a sound between them. You with me? It's, it's really digital in a sense. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's quantized. Well, so is light. It's quantized. So is everything quantized. And we discovered today, you and I are in what could properly be called a digital simulation, not analog, not continuous. It's very strange. And uh, we'll get into that next time somewhat. So this opens the door to the whole paradoxical world of quantum physics. 
And the chief player here is the photon. The, the corpo, it's, the, it's this uh, unit of light. You know, it's fascinating when you stand back. It was in 1906, J.J. Thompson, very, very prolific a scientist, got the Nobel, the Nobel Prize for proving that electrons were particles. No problem. What's interesting is his son in 1937 was awarded the Nobel Prize for proving that electrons were waves. <laughs> so each of you that raised your hands during my questions was correct. But the really bizarre part of this, you see the wave-particle duality, as they call it, is a central paradox in quantum physics. And let me just give you a glimpse ahead. There's now compelling evidence that the quanta only manifest themselves as particles is when we're looking at them. And you think, that, and I'm not joking. This is, this, we'll talk a little bit about that next time because it will alter your whole understanding of what you and I call reality. And that's where we'll get into that because it all impacts our understanding of the first um, chapters of Genesis. Let's shift to another subject, the velocity of light. In the 17th century, the, Johannes Kepler, the famous astronomer, René Descartes, the famous mathematician, and their following, of course, believed that light was instantaneous. They felt that light, w it, its speed was infinite, that light traveled instantly, and that was the sacred dicta. Until 1677, a Dutchman by the name of Olaf Romer, he measured the elapsed time between the eclipses of Jupiter with its moons. He noticed that if you measured the eclipse of, uh, of, of uh, the moons at Jupiter, you'd get about a 15-minute difference depending on where you were on the orbit. If you did it at certain times of the year, it would be different. And he began to realize that those distances were such that if he did this cleverly, he could actually measure the speed of light, which he did. And he found out, first of all, that light had a finite speed, a very high speed, roughly 300,000 meters per second, or 186,000 miles per second, as we would say it. But the, point, the main point was it was finite. That shook everybody. No one, no one would believe him. He had his data. The physics were something else you need to understand. Scientists like to brag that they're objective. That's baloney. That's utter baloney. They cling to their presuppositions with the same tenacity that we all cling to our prejudices. It takes an abundance of effort, uh, evidence and effort to get these incorrect notions unseated. And uh, Romer's experiment was repeated 50 years later by James Bradley, an Englishman. He confirmed Romer's work, and finally they began to acknowledge, gee, yeah, maybe light is not instantaneous, it has a finite speed. So that was the big breakthrough. Over the last 300 years, light has been measured 164 times at least by 16 different methods. And I thought I'd take you through each one, right? <laughs> no, of course not. Two guys, Barry Setterfield, a dear friend, an Australian, and Trevor Norman, a mathematician, did, were troubled by something. By the way, Barry Setterfield is a, one of the most deeply committed, practicing Christians I know. And he was wrestling with the whole problem, a certain problem in physics, and he, and, and he took it in a prayer as he describes it. How could this be if light is a constant? It was almost like a voice says, who said it's a constant? And he suddenly realized that he was, he was down a blind alley because he, he was in a situation to solve this problem. He'd have to challenge the idea, is light really a constant? So he and Trevor Norman decided to collect information. They went back and were able to dig up the raw data from these experiments through the centuries of the measurement of the speed of light. In 1677, when Romer measured the Io eclipse, his conclusion was that it was a, it, that the speed of light was about 307,600 uh, kilometers per second, with an error range of about 5,400 kilometers per second. Okay, not bad in view of the, the, those times, of course. In 1875, Harvard, using the same method, repeated the experiment, and because of better technology over you know uh, you know more than 100 years. Um, they had a lower error band. Instead of 5,400 kilometers per second, it was down to 13 kilometers, give or take. You follow me? And uh, then in uh, 1983, the National Bureau of Standards, using a laser, ran their experiment, and they got the error down to 0. .00003 kilometers per second. So as you look through the you know, couple of centuries here, you realize that the technology is improving. The error band is getting much more precise. But that's not what caught Barry Satterfield's eye. What disturbed him is look at the mean. 
It went from 307,600 down to 299,921, then down to 299,792. It's the time, the speed is slowly decreasing. It's actually getting asymptotic. A guy, a, a, a mathematician by the name of Alan Montgomery, took all the data and subjected to a rigorous computer analysis and came to the conclusion that the regression, not just of these three experiments, I just give you three to give you a summary, that if you look at all the data, there's a 99% correlation to what he called the cosecant squared curve. In other words, it's been, if it's going slower now, it went faster in the past. How much faster? Somewhere between 10 and 30% faster in the time of Christ, somewhere about twice as fast in the days of Solomon, somewhere about four times as fast in the days of Abraham, and about 10 million times as fast prior to 3000 BC. Now, this of course, was it was started to be published here over a decade ago, was given the, the, the horse laugh by all the classical physicists. Who are these characters and, and don't they understand the speed of light? Everybody's been in physics. The more you know about physics, the more you've been into atomic structures, you discover the speed of light is a factor on almost every equation you get into in terms of energy transfers and, uh, and on and on and on. The speed of light's a very fundamental parameter. But that's the point, it's a parameter, not a constant. And so the idea that it's not a constant shook them. But even Einstein expressed surprise during his lifetime that anything would be constant in the universe. He, re he accepted it as a constant, but reluctantly, because he just, he had a, 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 he held, he withheld some disbelief. So this, first of all, pulls the rug out from under any reckoning of time. You're talking radiological time? Or you're talking orbital time? See, suddenly you're raising some serious questions here. And in the first six days, let's rephrase that. In the first five days of the creation week, who was around? Only God. So I'll take him at his word. <laughs> okay? So, and th this is why more and more scientists are beginning to accept the many evidences in many fields of science that the Earth is actually far younger than most people have any idea. Less than 10,000 years, not millions and millions and millions. Now, we went through a few of those last time. We'll give you some others before our series is over. Now, there are other confirmations here. This kind of thing was mentioned in uh, uh, French Astronomical Journal in 27. Uh, Tom Flander, Van Flanderen in the U.S. Naval Observatory um, mo points out that atomic clocks are slowing relative to orbital clocks. I'll come back to that in a minute. A guy by Trotsky in, in, uh, Gorky, in, uh, in uh, Moscow, independent of Satterfield, about the same time, published back in 87, a similar kind of insight. And there have been other, there are, now the, I'll tell you what really bothers me. In the last 18 to 24 months, there have been literally dozens of articles in the reputable journals, Nature, Science, these, these the, the highly reputable journals, by different guys who've discovered the speed of light's not constant. What frosts me about watching this parade on the one hand, I'm gratified to see that we're not, we're not out in left field with some weird idea that this is, this is now becoming uh, accepted. But I find it significant that none of these guys have had the integrity or the character to acknowledge Barry Setterfield's original papers. The abuse that he had from the profession for more than 10 years, um, you'd think would at least merit a reference. But there are none forthcoming. Um, there are now articles around that betray that, and there's plenty of this stuff on the, in, uh, on the uh, internet for those that are interested. This atomic versus orbital time, you know, see, before 1967, uh, the second was defined as a, a very, very small fraction of one Earth orbit around the sun. I won't bother with the decimals here, but you get the idea. In 1967, they redefined the second to become a certain number of oscillations of the cesium atom. So the definition of one second got nailed from the one system to the other. You follow me? And uh, so that means that all the measurements of time since 67 are done in atomic terms, not in orbital terms. You with me? Well, they've also discovered something. Or, uh, Van, Van Flanderen in the, at the observatory points out if atomic clocks are correct, then the orbital speeds of Mercury, Venus, and Mars are increasing. <laughs> that can't happen, of course, because there's where's the energy coming from. So that opposite must be true. See, if the gravitational constant is truly constant, then the atomic vibration and the speed of light are decreasing. 
And so, you see, if a planet's orbital speed increased, it would violate the law of conservation of energy, the first law of thermodynamics. If the atomic clocks are correct, the gravitational constant should change, and no such variations have been detected. So this is, if the atomic frequencies are decreasing, then five properties of the atom, such as Planck's constant, should also be changing. And statistical studies support both the magnitude and the direction of this change. So there's four out of five of the properties of the atom are confirming the idea that the speed of light is slowing down. It has profound implications for science. It has drastic implications for our understanding of the universe. And that's why I'm dragging you through this. Something else you've all heard about, the red shift. I'm sure if you've done any reading in technology, you know the idea that stars have their light shifted to the red. That's called the red shift. If you look at the specter, it shifts slightly to the red. And so a guy by the name Edwin Hubble in the 20s postulated that the ones that are furthest away are shifting most to the red, so he, he argues, he assumed, that it's shifted to the red because they're speeding away from us. So the red shift the spec in the star specter is treated as an evidence that the universe has been expanding. That's where we get the idea of the expanding universe. That's why the Hubble telescope is named after Edwin Hubble, because of what they call Hubble's law. The more it shifts to the red, the further away it is. That's been the dictum of, in the, if you take a course in astronomy, at whatever level in college, that's what they'll teach you, the basis of Hubble's law. Well, there's a couple of guys, one in Germany, Halton Arp, and one in the University of Arizona, William Tift, have taken up on themselves for 20 or 30 years of collecting data on red shifts. And that's the, that was their area of professional interest. And they particularly cataloged what they call aberrant red shifts. Some of the stars aren't moving away, they're moving towards us. So they, collect, they try to collect the ones that aren't following the rules, so to speak, right? But William Tift has discovered something rather shocking. As he analyzed the data, he discovered that this red shift always is a multiple of a number. In other words, it, it, it can't be anywhere. Again, it's like piano keys. It'll be at some number, a, 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 an exact multiple of a, a certain constant. It's quantized, in other words. And he didn't bring any conjectures. He just reports the data. But there have been scientists who take that data and start analyzing it, and they've discovered something really interesting. They can explain the red shift, not by the rate at which the star is moving away from us, but by the change in the speed of light as it impacts atomic behavior. Since the orbits of electrons are fixed places, and so the speed of light changes, these certain atomic, subatomic phenomena will occur in, in, in discrete steps. And those dis discrete steps can account for the red shift. So it's not conclusive yet. They're still researching this. But it's very possible that the whole idea of the red shift being uh, evidence of expansion is uh, suspect at this point. And uh, the red shift is another strange confirmation that the speed of light's been slowing down. There's something else I, wanna sh I think that's kind of interesting. I'm changing the subject a little bit here. You know, if you take, you start re studying the attributes of God, you can come up with a number of things. He's obviously infinite, located at infinity, or however you want to express that. He obviously is capable of infinite power, right? He represents omnipresence. He can be anywhere all the time. He also is omniscient. He knows everything. Anyone have a problem with that? Good, okay. It's interesting that light has properties analogous to those. Light has no, uh, a perfect light has no parallax. It's located at infinity. Light has a velocity limit, but it's limited by the intrinsic physics of the universe. It's also omnipresent. It turns out they've also discovered, and we'll talk about this next time, protons lack locality. They've discovered that all photons in the universe know what the other photons are doing. That's, that's, a, that's a layman's way of trying to express what they mean when they say there's non-locality. Um, we'll talk about that next time we get into particle physics a little bit. Um, but also, um, uh, the light is the fundamental revelatory mechanism. It's the primary way we reveal things. Because when the light comes on, we can see and we can understand. And so it, 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 fit, it fits the attributes of God. It's interesting that in James 1.17, it's every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. The word variableness is the word from which we get the word parallax, meaning he's at infinity. Just thought I'd throw that in for fun. Well, let's get back to the, the, the text at hand. God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were day one. 
How many have read that before? <laughs> Ever bothered you that the, the evening and the morning were day one? I thought it was morning to evening. Well, you can pick, if you want to say evening to evening, that's 24 hour day, right? But even if I was going to use idiomatically a half a day as my idiom for the day, we have a tendency from morning to evening. A full day, morning to evening, right? This says from evening to morning. Because it does, the Jews have adopted the concept that the day starts at evening, at sundown. But that derives from this. They do that because that's what the text says. It implies that. And maybe some other reasons too, for all I know. But there's something else that occurs, we'll discover. Each day, day one, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, evening and morning was day X, right? You get to the seventh day, right? Chapter 2 deals with the seventh day. Something very weird. There's no evening and morning. Did the seventh day have an evening and a morning? I'm sure it did. You know, the earth's spinning. I, you know, by then everything's, you know, in order. Is it possible that Erev and Boker, the two Hebrew words here, don't, didn't mean evening and morning? Is there something else that's being communicated here? Let's examine this. By the way, in uh, uh, Isaiah 45, verse 7, it says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. The, I create darkness. You know, it's interesting. I always thought darkness was the absence of light. No. God says, I form the light and I create darkness. He's not talking about just the absence of light. I suspect he's talking about the possibility that there are things that light can't escape. We call them black holes. That, 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 that gravity is so intense that even photons can't leave the black hole. So that's black. That's black. Anyway, we'll talk about that next time. I want to, um, uh, before I get to the Arab Boker thing, I, I want to include another addendum in here on holography. As we're talking about light, this is, th there's an analogy that emerges from this that I just couldn't resist sharing with you, so this is just an a, a extra thing here. There's a thing called holography. An 18th uh, century Frenchman uh, created a thing called the Fourier transform. Engineers are very familiar with this to, to, to change things from the space domain and the frequency domain and the frequency domain and space domain. We use it all the time in engineering for complex waves. But the point is, in 1947, Dennis Gabor, who got a Nobel Prize for his invention, he was trying to improve an electron microscope, which in those days was pretty primitive and deficient. He was working on that when he discovered what we know today as a hologram. And uh, modern holographic images really derive from the work of Emmett Leith at the University of Michigan. And I had the privilege of being with him in his laboratory in the early 60s, looking at some computer-generated holograms. And so uh, uh, holograms are, it's worth your trouble to stick with me here to see what a hologram is. Let's assume I have a three-dimensional object. I'm using here the bust of Lincoln as an idiom on the slide. And I have a piece of photographic film, OK? I can arrange a laser beam to flood that uh, image directly, OK? And I'll call that the reference beam. Because the laser is very collimated, I use a beam splitter, a spreader to spread that over the spread of the, the image. I can also have that same laser deflect some of its light and shine it directly on the object of interest. You with me so far? So I've got the laser driving an illumination of the film plate and the object simultaneously by highly, highly organized light. That's what a laser does. It's temporarily, uh, uh, it, it, it's in phase altogether. So light will reflect from the bust onto the film, and it'll also get light from, directly from the laser. What you end up with on the film, when you process the film in the darkroom, you hold up the light, and it looks like a fog piece of film. You think it's a darkroom mistake until you set it down and you shine the laser on that piece of film and you discover it acts like a window into a three-dimensional space that was in front of it when this thing was formed. And it has some very unusual pro that's called a hologram. It's some people call it lensless photography. That's a little misnomer because you do have some lenses trying to organize the light to get it where you want it. But, but, uh, so the point is, there's a, what's on the film is what mathematically is a Fourier transform of the image. It's not in the space domain, it's in the frequency domain. And that has some profound implications. It acts like a window in three-dimensional space. Let's imagine you have three a hologram in three-dimensional space. And 
as we look at it, as we move our eye around, you can look around things. Let me give you an example. Let's assume that I held up my Bible and you took a photograph of me. You would not be able to see my tie, would you? But if you took a hologram, you could move your eye around the Bible and see my tie and tell what color it was. You follow me? That's what I mean by a three-dimensional effect. And uh, so it, uh, it requires proper illumination. It's useless in natural light. You really need to have it illuminated by a laser. I'm talking about a true hologram, not a synthetic one. Um, something interesting, the information of the hologram is spread over the entire piece. That has some, I could cut the hologram in half and get two complete pictures. If I took a photograph and cut it in half, you're going to get one half or the other, right? But if I take a hologram and cut it in half, you each have one and gives you a complete picture. One might not be as sharp as, you know, be a little, not quite as sharp as it was. You lose a little resolution. You can cut a hole in the hologram and it doesn't hurt you because you can look around it, see what was behind it. Follow me? See, every piece of information is on every inch of the hologram. It's spread, okay? Um, there's no loss from dropouts. It's also resilient to specific interference. There's no way to jam it, so to speak. It anticipates hostile jamming. Now, where I'm headed here, as you can probably tell, you have the equivalent of a hologram in your lab. Just like a, a natural hologram, in normal white light, there's, it has no form or comeliness. There's no reason for you to desire it. But you illuminate it by the light that created it in the first place, you get an image. And when you take your Bible and it's illuminated by the Holy Spirit, you get an image of what? Jesus Christ. It goes, more than, oh, by the way, if you illuminate it with a laser that's of a different frequency than created, you get a false image. Ooh. You're with me. You're, get, you're picking up. I can tell. Okay, good. The Bible's a hologram. It has Fourier transform pr properties. It's, it's a transcendent of any parallax. And that's exactly what Isaiah says. Isaiah 28 says, The word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. What's he saying? The, the message of God in the Bible is spread throughout the entire Bible. You could conduct an experiment, take your Bible, randomly tear out a page. Don't literally do it, but do it conceptually. What have you lost? There is no important doctrine, no important truth in the scripture you will have lost. It's immune. It, in fact, it's been designed in anticipation of what we would call in communication engineering hostile jamming. There's no chapter on baptism. There's no chapter on salvation. There's no chapter. Pick a, to a doctrine. It's not all in one place. It is deliberately spread. And that, if you're a communications engineer and you're given a certain bandwidth between two points and your job is to design a communication system to communicate to the, between those two points, there are a lot of ways you can go about it, but if you say if you want you to, they want you to design it in anticipation of hostile jamming. Someone's going to try to jam your signal. What do you do? You do several things, one of which is you spread your message over the available bandwidth. You don't concentrate it, you spread it because it's harder to jam. That's exactly what's been done in the scripture. The scripture has been designed with a sophistication that will astonish you as you uh, get into it. So we have the Bible as a hologram. We have what, we, what the engineer would call spread spectrum design. It exploits the entire bandwidth and therefore has immunity to hostile jamming. I've often threatened to do this. Um, we're going to have a meeting tonight and we're going, at the meeting we're going to tear out the page of the Bible that's unimportant. And then when everybody gets together, I'll take the page between the Old and New Testament and tear it out. And it's one book, not two. Right. Okay. I thought that would smoke out the fundamentalists. Okay. <laughs> I want to get across another idea that's really fundamental. And this is, this is a very advanced concept that you can test yourself with no mathematics. If I take disorder, the opposite of that is order. Do you understand what I mean? Say order and disorder, they're opposites, right? You understand the difference between noise and signal. Signal is what's desirable, noise is what's getting in the way. There's music and there's cacophony. I won't ask which kind our teenagers listen to. Well. <laughs> there's chaos in the cosmos. Those in the Greek are intentionally opposites. Chaos we understand. Cosmos is a term for order out of chaos. Okay? And randomness in design. Do you see that each of these are opposites? You with me? 
Disorder, noise, cacophony, chaos, randomness are a description of what some people would call entropy. Think of it as a synonym of randomness, that which is just there by accident, if you will. Order, signal, music, cosmos, design, speaks of information. They are opposites. They are opposites. In fact, almost any information, any kind of data you happen to get your hands on will fit somewhere between the two extremes. Some of it will be very, very precise, pure information. More than likely, it'll have some errors or some allowance for error. Or it can be totally, totally random. I might mention, by the way, trying to find a totally random number is, a, is an elusive task. We can get pseudo-random numbers. You, you can't get at either extreme of this continuum, but you can imagine a continuum here where entropy is at one end, information at the other. Now, what's interesting, there is a law observed in every field of science called the law of entropy. Things always tend to move towards entropy. And that has, that has some profound implications, but let me give you a simple way to prove it to yourself. Take your closet at home, your desktop at work, your locker at school, your workshop or garage, spend a Saturday morning cleaning it all up and getting it orderly. What happens in a few days, a few weeks? What does it tend toward? Right back to where it was before, randomness. It takes energy and it takes information to sort it. Not just energy that you move it somewhere, you have to have a logical pattern. You alphabetize the book, so you do you know, whatever your scheme is. But the point is, it takes conscious, intelligent effort to create order. It doesn't happen by itself. Never, ever. Uh, it, it, uh, so the point is, there's a law of entropy. Now, this shows up most dramatically, perhaps, in thermodynamics. Everything goes from that is hot, cools. Everything is moving towards the ambient temperature. Whatever heat there is in, say, a bottle, as it cools, that energy contributes a slight increase in the ambient. So that tells you several things. First of all, that means that there will eventually be a day, if nothing else happens, there's a day when the entire universe will wind down. When things are a uniform temperature, no work can be done. All work, all energy is a function of temperature difference. It also means that somebody wound it all up. All the sources of energy had to be established by someone. It didn't just happen. Everything we see throughout the entire universe, everything we see in every field of science except one I'll come to, understands what they call the law of entropy. The law, there are really two laws. One is the conservation of matter and energy, the law of conservation. You can't, matter and energy can't, they can be transformed one to another, but they can't be created or destroyed. The total amount of mass or energy in the universe is a constant. That's the law of conservation, no problem there. The second law is the tough one. Second law says you can't create a transfer without something being lost. Putting it another way, you can't build a machine that's 100% efficient. You're going to lose something to friction. You're going to lose something to the ambient ambience. So every machine has an efficiency that is less than 100%. So the way you, you can remember the law, first law says that you can't win. The second, well, the second one, you are going to lose. <laughs> there's always a loss. You can't, the second one, you can't. Uh, there's a third one too that you can't get out of the game, but that's a whole other thing. Um, every field of science leans on the value of the law of entropy laws, except one, and that's the field of biology. Because when they try to tell you that organization and life happen on its own, out of chance, that is a Bald-faced re refutation of everything we know about the law of entropy. Can't happen. Cannot happen. All mutations are degenerative. All mutations are a loss of information. We'll get to that in subsequent sessions. But let's get, to this other, back, get back to this closing thing because time's running out. And the evening and the morning were day one. That's the last verse of our little tour de force tonight. The word Erev, or first of all, uh, evening, morning, were day one, Yom Echad. What does the word Echad mean? That one's easy, one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one, is Echad, one, singular. Yom is a problem. 
Nobody knows what yom means because it's used for 54 different words. However, out of 1,480 uses in the Bible, 1,181 of them, it means day, like you and I think of a day. When there's a number associated with it, it is always a literal, what we would call a 24-hour day. There are some cases where 67 of those cases are called time or detay or forever, continually, age. In the context, it can be used as a synecdoche. It can be used as a rhetorical figure of speech in certain cases. But not when there's a number associated with it that makes it pre the, the precision that's implied is quite clear. So much for that. So a day is a day. But let me tell you, our problem about is, did God create it in six days is not out of Genesis. You can find ways to weasel word your way around that if you really insist. The problem you've got is Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, where God, writing in stone, says the following. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do no, uh, shall not do any work, thou or thy son or thy daughter, manservant, and so on, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For, notice what he says here. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Clearly, God intends us to understand that the days of Genesis were literal days. Because that's what he says. Their problem is here, not in Genesis. If those are millions, e eons of millions of years, then God is being dece deceptive. God cannot lie. God does not deceive. So that's why we can take comfort in the fact we know from the scripture it was six days. And we also are gratified that as we start looking at science carefully, we discover it supports those, those views. And we'll try to do that in our court thing here. But let me get back to evening in the morning, day one. The word evening is Erev. The word morning is Bokar. Erev and Bokar were day one. Let's set aside our presuppositions of what Erev and Boker mean. The only barrier to truth, the only certain barrier to truth, is the presumption you already have it. If you want to know what those words mean, let's set aside what we suspect they might mean, and let's look at them and see what they say. By the way, neither of these words are recorded during the seventh day, so that's a clue that they don't mean what we think they mean. Erev. The term comes from a root which means obscuration, also to mix, a mixture. A mathematician would say that means it, it, it speaks of mixing, uh, increasing em, uh, entropy. And see, when encroaching darkness begins to deny our ability to discern forms or shapes or identities, right, it becomes a synonym for twilight. That's a time of approaching darkness. So the word later becomes to mean evening. But its original root meaning may have been something more fundamental. <clears throat> Sunset, make, uh, marking the duration of impurity. You know, it's interesting in Levit Leviticus 15 that uh, uh, there, when a ceremonially unclean person became clean again was at the end of the day. It was, it, it, that's, that was, that, that's why it was the end of the day, but it becomes the beginning of the next one. You follow me? That's why the Jews have the, uh, the um, evening be the beginning of the 24-hour day, right? But even if you accept that as this, it's, it's still strange that it's the... Evening through to the morning is day one. That sounds like he's only talking about the nighttime. That's where it doesn't quite fit when you think about it. Okay? But this is the beginning of the Hebrew day today. What did it mean originally? We're going to see. The other term is boker. In the morning, boker tov. Good morning. Okay? Boker means becoming discernible, distinguishable, visible. It's the perception, the beginning perception of order. It's the relief of obscurity. A mathematician would call it decreasing entropy. It's, the, it's accompanied with the attendant ability to begin to discern forms, shapes, distinct identities. The breaking forth of light, revealing. And because of that, it becomes a name for the dawn or the morning. Well, let's, take, let's make an entropy profile of the universe. Okay, I have a little chart here divided with, with seven days. The left side is entropy with maximum at the bottom and minimum at the top. In other words, what I want to do is go from chaos at the bottom to order at the top, as shown on the right-hand side. You with me? Okay. So, Erev means obscurity, disorder. Later, it means evening. Boker means orderly or discernible. So, we, have, we go from Erev to Boker, and that becomes day one. 
Day one is the beginning of the introduction of order out of chaos. Okay, that becomes day one. We then go from Erev to Boker, and that's day two. We go from Erev to Boker, and that's day three. We go from Erev to Boker, and that's day four. We go from Erev to Boker, that's day five. We go from Erev to Boker, and that's day six. We get to day seven. There is no Erev to Boker. There is no creation going on. There is no addition to order. God saw everything, and it was good. You with me? So I'm not minimizing the, the uh, they are still talking 24-hour days as far as I'm concerned, because God said so in Exodus 20, verse 11. But I think what clearly is going on is a step-by-step -step design going on from the general to the specific, and climax, of course, with the creation of man as God's handiwork. And uh, then the seventh day has no Erev and Boker. Did it have an evening and morning? Of course it did. But there wasn't creative action going on. It was a day of repose. In fact, God isn't just resting. He imposed a, he imposed a repose on the earth, on the, on the universe. That's when the law, the scientific law, has probably got solidified in the, in the speculation of some. So anyway, that's what we're doing. We've been through day one, verses two through five. Talked about the gap theory a bit, origin of Satan, and a lot of background on the mysterious nature of light. In our next session, we're going to talk about God stretches the heavens. What on earth does that mean? We'll talk a little bit about the Big Bang models. What is all that about? But more importantly, we'll talk about the nature of space. What do we really mean by it? Is it emptiness? Not at all. And what do we mean by hyperdimensions? We get some very simple ways of understanding those. And we'll talk a little bit about the peculiar conclusions of quantum physics. And from there, we'll go, next day, time we'll go, on the third day, Tuesday, we'll go into the origin of life. And we'll talk a little bit about thermodynamics, entropy, and molecular chemistry. And the fourth day, we'll talk about stars and planets. We'll talk about the nebular hypothesis, the anthropic principle. We'll talk about some things we've learned from the extraterrestrial life and things of that nature. And we'll talk in fifth day, we'll talk about fish and fowl, and we'll face head on some of the fallacies of evolution. We'll talk about the evidences of design and some other surprises. Sixth day, the animals and man, we'll talk about fallacies and frauds. One of the field of paleontology is probably the most uh, uh, disgusting series of deliberate frauds, not misguided, well meaning people, people deliberately uh, uh, in, in, uh, fabricating evidence. We'll talk about DNA, and that is fun. There's some exciting things we'll go through there. And above all, we'll talk about the architecture of man. How, is, how are you organized inside? Hardware, software. And at seventh day, we'll talk about some surprises there. So, so that's, for the next session, I want you to think about what is the Big Bang? You've heard about it. Get your thoughts together. How can space be stretched, rolled, or torn? The Bible is full of passages which talk about space being stretched or rolled up. What does that mean? Or torn. And what two concepts in mathematics are totally elusive as far as our physical universe is concerned? There's two concepts in mathematics, fundamental ones, that you cannot find in the physical universe. We'll talk a little bit about that. So that's, our, that's uh, what we're about. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. It's Bar Hearts. Father, we just thank you for your handiwork how it speaks of you, Father. As we, the more we learn, the more we stand in awe of what you've done and who you are. We also recognize, Father, that your peak achievement is not the creation, but your plan of redemption because it cost you so much. We thank you, Father, for your word. We do pray, Father, that you help each of us to grow in grace the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that he is on every page. We do pray, Father, that you would help each of us more fully understand what it is that you would have of us in the days ahead, that we each might be better stewards of the opportunities that you've crafted for each of us. We do pray, Father, you increase in each of us a hunger and appetite for your truth. We ask all these things in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.